Okay. So welcome everybody to this talk is modern identity management in the era of serverless and microservices. So I will start with this. So why security matters? And what makes that developers or the technology industry don't take care about security? So if you don't believe that they don't take care, I will show you some statistics and real cases about big data breaches. So the first are some uh, US data uh, breaches statistics. So here are watching, this is for the first uh, six months of the year. And they have a 50% of increase in the first half of the 2019 uh, related to last year in 2018. And they also were reported uh, around like 3,800 data breaches just in the first six months of the years. And those are the reported data breaches. And then we have around like 3.2 billion uh, information exposed only on just of eight of those data breaches. There are around 80% like of all the information that were exposed. Then we have other example. I don't know how many of you know this company, Equifax. Yeah, a few of you, someone. Uh, laughing here, but Equifax is a consumer credit reporting agency that works in UK, uh, Canada, and United States. And they have a big cybersecurity attack in September of 2017. Uh, and well, this is all the official reports, but Equifax report that around like 38,000 driver license and around like 3,200 password detail were loaded to their uh, um, system. And then also they have uh, some information stolen uh, for the system. And they report around like 146.6 uh, million names and dates of birth, around like uh, 145 million social security numbers, also 99 million address, and around like 209,000 payment card numbers at expiration dates. This is all the information that were stolen in this data range. So uh, this was a huge and big cybersecurity attack. And what happened is that Equifax has no security in any of the levels that we have. Uh, then, well, I think that this is more common here in Europe than in other places, but uh, thanks with that DG. GDPR regulation, now you cannot make things like Equifax. If not, you will need to pay fees to the European Union if you don't have security. So security must be a goal in every single implementation that we have. But what happened is like something that the tech industry don't understand is that security is a team effort. It's not about like, okay, this is take care to the security expert. So the question is, our company has a security expert. My team has access to a security expert. And also, a security expert is not a person that will implement every security aspect on a system. They only will suggest to us or give us tips about what things we need to implement in the security. So we can have security in a network uh, layer, in the device, application, infrastructure, data, and also identity security. This is a talk about identity security, or if you want to see, it's about best practices for have a good identity in our projects. So what is the roadmap to this talk? We were still talking about that REST API design, something wrong that I am watching around the world, and how we can improve this, uh, how we can use JWTs. Also, we will talk a little bit about the user credentials problems. Then we will introduce to you uh, identity management uh, concept and also identity and access management. And then we will have a section of best practices and how we can have a successful identity management project. Then I will talk to you about identity as a service and we will talk about architectural level. If we have a few times, so I will bring uh, a fast demo of all this. So my name is Mercedes Bis. I am from Guatemala, a little bit far away from here. Uh, I am a community leader in Guatemala. I have uh, two communities, one focused on Google technologies. Another is uh, J. Duchess chapter that are the female uh, Java communities. I also was a member of the Guatemala Java Users Group. In, um, well, now I am working as CTO in a startup based in Guatemala. And I am recognized for two uh, developer programs, the Outsider Ambassador and the Oracle Groundbreakers Ambassadors. So we will start talking about the bad API designs. So what happened? We have a REST API, right? And we have some client apps that will consume these REST APIs. So what happened in these wrong designs in terms of identity uh, on the fact of make authorization and authentication? So 
The app is our design it for we send in every single request the username and the password of the client. So what is wrong with this approach? First is that we are requiring in every single request the username and a password. But we cannot ask to the user that they introduce the username and the password, always that they uh, make a transaction in the system. So what we are doing is saving these credentials in the client. So this is wrong because also we can uh, save in the wrong way those credentials and it's a, it's a wrong approach. So what, how we can improve this? So we can use this float or auth, exist other ones like OpenID or some more complicated than some, but I only will talk about OAuth. So we have our clients and we have our REST API. And now we have a third guy that will be the OAuth server. So how works this flow? So the first thing that we will do or the client do is the client will make the login, the authentication process. They will request an access token to the authentication server. So the authentication server will validate all those credentials. And if those credentials are good, they will return a token. So now this token will be saved in the client side. So here, other wrong approach is that now the people say, OK, I will say the username and the password in my token. And we'll say this token with the username and the password. So other wrong thing is that always that we are verifying this username and password, we are really are making an authentication and authorization process at the same time, in, instead of only make once. So now we have this token. The next step is called our REST API. And now we will send this access token to the REST API. So our REST API will have communication with the authentication server for validate if this token is a valid token. So this validation start uh, verifying if it's a token that was signed or created for our system. The next thing is that it's properly signed, was not corrupted in any point of the life cycle of the application. The next thing that we need to verify in this process is that this user has the permissions for access the information that they wanted. Uh, this is something really important because sometimes developers delegate the authorization section of our implementation to the client side. What I mean with this is like, so. I make a login, and I will return to the client. You know, this is uh, this kind of role uh, user. So I will show to this user only the functions that he has access in the system. And I trust that they will not access to any other thing because he don't have access in what he's facing. But for example, in web applications, we can uh, obtain all the endpoints that have a website. So I can access an endpoint instead when I don't have permissions to that. And this is so important wh why we need to verify the authorization process, these permissions. So if all these things are valid, we will return this uh, to the client saying, you know, this is a valid token. This user has the right permissions for access the resource that is demanding to your REST API. If not both, we can answer to him that he don't have access. So finally, we will report to the client uh, with the information. So for implement those tokens, uh, in nowadays is really, really common use JWTs. We can use other tokens or create our own tokens. So how many of you know about JWTs? So many of you, this is good. So I will skip this section fast just for the guys that don't know that. But basically, it's an open standard that was created for transfer JSON data in an encrypted way. And we saw a JWT like this one. So we have here a header and some claims. Uh, what happened with this approach to only use JWTs is that I can take this JWT, I can see the information that is inside the JWT, and I also can modify the information of that WT. So we combine JSON uh, web tokens with other other of this standard that is the JSON web signature. So in this case, I will add a signature to this token for verify that anyone modified that information. So I almost will have access to see the information travel in the token, but I will cannot modify that information. So we have a lot of uh, signature algorithms. And here are something really important. Doesn't matter if I choose the most strongest cryptography algorithm if I am using a way key. So we need to choose the right algorithms and also 
create or use a good keys for implement our signature. So now we will see a JWT like this one. So we have the, clay, uh, the header, the claims, and then we have the signature. If we explore this JWT, we will have this. So we are watching here uh, in the header, we basically only put the algorithms that we use it for create this token, and we have the type that is a JWT. And then we have the, the claims, uh, that is uh, basically the data that we want to send. We have some uh, predefined claims, and we also can add other claims that we wanted. And finally, we have here how is created uh, the signature. So we have here some interesting claim. This is uh, some predefining that is the sub. Basically, these claims is for identifier with user to our system represent this token. In this case, we will not use the username. We need to create a different identifier inside our system. Uh, this is other interesting one. It, this is not one of the officialists, but uh, scopes are really used when we want to define in the token which permissions have this user. Uh, this is other interesting, the type in the header. Uh, and this is more because when we are creating systems, all the entire system is not development in the same programming language. So that means that sometimes we will need to choose different libraries uh, for implement something in the client or other in the backend or in an IoT project, for example. So some libraries skip this type, and sometimes we have problems verifying these tokens just for uh, it's not traveling the type or it's traveling. So we need to be careful with that. So these are some of the register claims. Um, I will explain other interesting one. We have the JTI. Uh, this basically is for create a unique identifier to the JWT. And this is this approaches user, for example, when I want to use this token only once. So I will send just this uh, unique identifier in the database instead to save all the JWT. Also, we saw the sub, uh, we have this other one, the issuer of the token. So maybe in my system, will not only the backend, that one that will create tokens, if not, I will create in different points of the system a token. So with the is, I will define which uh, all of these elements in the system created a token. And also we have this, the X is for expiration date. Uh, this works for uh, tokens that have an expiration time. So. What problems solves JWTs? So we are talking here about solving authentication and authorization, but we also can use them for implement federated identity, information exchange, also client-side session or client-side secrets. So if someone doesn't have clear about uh, where is the authentication and where is the authorization process, uh, the authentication process basically is when a user make a login. So he brings his credentials uh, to the system and the system validate these credentials and create a token. And the authorization process is after the login. So it's when the user send this token, we validate the token and we verify that have permissions. So if someone wants to go in deep to JWTs, I recommend to you this really good website that is jwt.io. Also, they suggest uh, libraries for use. And also read this uh, good handbook. Uh, here explain how to implement authentication authorization. Also use JWT for implement federated identities or client-side sessions. So for continue, now we will have an improvement in our API design. So instead to always stay sending the username and the password, we will use a token that could be a JWT. So for continue, now it's time to talk about the user credentials problem. So this is a big problem in the industry, and it's not only about users, it's all also with us. So which password did you use for the server or for the, uh, you know, the development uh, system? Oh, QWERTY. Really good password, right? Super secure. And what is the problem with that is that we also are continue only using single signing on as the only option for make login. And also is a kind of technology that is coming in the future obsolete, or is that the users don't want to use this anymore. Especially happen things like Equifax, right? Like we have these data branches with our password are exposed. So the password are exposed. We are not saving those passwords encrypted in the database. So what make the technology industry for solve this problem? So one guy came, you know, I have the most biggest and better solution for that. We will create rules for the people create security passwords. And what happened? Things like that. 
So this grandpa create a super security password that is password one, two, three, exclamation mark, with P uppercase. So what is the problem is this password is matching all the rules, but it's not a secure password. So we need to improve our rules and bring with systems with so crazy rules like this one. So then happen situations like this other one, so that we go to one system, we introduce our password, they say wrong password, wrong password, and then it's like, what happened with that? I tried to restart the password, I put my old password and say, you cannot put that one. You know, I have a system that I never try to make the login. I always go to recovery password because always is this same situation. So what we can do to improve this post, uh, process, making it easier and safer. This is the most important thing. So here I will introduce the identity management definition. So other of the things that we are forgetting in nowadays is that the users make more than only single signing on in our systems. So they also have an entire life cycle and we are having every day more complex systems. So identity management is an umbrella term around like identity in corporate environments as usually. So talk about provisioning. In this case, we will have uh, entities in the world that want to make a uh, login in our systems. So this entity will have an assignment of an identity and attributions for make a login. So one of the important things here is that we need to start to separate the users to our system of actors of the system. So I will explain that. So this is a simple case that the actor and the user always is the same. So I will use an example, banks. I like use banks because they have a lot of cases of example. So banks has uh, customers, right? And uh, the customers can have different products inside the bank. But also the bank have a system, right? For handle all the information to these customers. But also banks offer bank applications. So for permit the users can access uh, or and see all the information that they have in the system, you know, uh, make an actualization of their information or see how many money they have in an account or how many money they need to pay to the credit card or a loan. But this is a typical case when this same customer is an actor of the bank because he's the one that have a product in the bank and also is a user of their applications. But what happened in a case uh, when uh, they are not actors of the system? So instead to have a normal person, we will have a company, for example. So companies also have products in a bank, say so have accounts, have credit cards. But what happened with big companies? So the owner of these products in the bank is not the one that will pay the salaries to the employees of the company every month. So they will have, for example, a company uh, counter. So they will bring access to the counter to the information that they have in the bank, in the system, or at least to the account that they will use for pay the salaries. So it's the counter that one that will access the bank applications for see the information to the customer that is that company. In that case, the counter is not an actor of the system in the bank. So is he's only a user of the application for access other products that had other actor in the system. So we also need to prepare our uh, implementations, our systems for work in this kind of context. The next thing that we need to face in the case of provisioning is that we in nowadays are not only facing with human beings accessing our systems. So we also can have robots, we can have IoT projects, we have other kind of interfaces like voice user interfaces accessing our systems. And also, this uh, talk don't include that, but we can have different flows for handle every different kind of users that we will face in our system. The next thing uh, that many people, many developers forgot is the account management. And this is why we save the password unencrypted in a database. So what includes the account management? So we need to face how we will maintain those informations, how we will save those information also. We will use encryption, so which 
algorithms of encryption, we kind of keys, or I will choose, for example, a database that make a mask of all the information that I am saving there. Also, uh, how I will handle some things, like someone erased the, their account, or what happened when someone is not longer active in my system. So all those things are things that we need to ask before to start a project for have a successful one. And finally, we have the identity governance. Initially, this is uh, faced with the fact that users have different permissions. So they will have roles inside the system. But we also need to think that maybe one same system for handle identities will work with other different systems. And I will put again uh, a company system. So for example, big companies have different system, a system for handle uh, the sellers, a system for handle uh, the production section, a system for handle, uh, the I don't know, the teach team. So, and sometimes one single person have access to all those systems. And what happened is like he has a different credentials for access different systems inside the same company. So what we need to do is have one single systems for handle this for these things, the login and the identities and permit to the rest of the system of the companies use this same system. This is identity governance. Then we have identity and access management. Here, basically, we are facing uh, how will we allow these individuals. Basically, the right individuals access the right resource the, at the right time for the right reason. So and here, we have the authentication, authorization, and also identity federation. So we will explain the easy one, that is authorization. So like I explained before, it's only verified to this entity that is trying to access our system is a valid entity inside the system, and also has the permissions that they uh, for access the information that he is trying to access. Then we have identity federation. So I have all this logo from the Facebook applications. Here we have first uh, Facebook Katana, then we have Facebook Lite, Orca, Facebook uh, La, uh, Messenger Lite, Creator Pages, Moments, Announcement, Analytics, F8. So all these are applications from Facebook. What I have all these examples here is because, for example, if I download first uh, Messenger in my cell phone, I make a login in Facebook. Then I download uh, Facebook Lite or a Katana, and when I access, I don't need to make login in again. Facebook verified if exists other application in my cell phone, and they also verify if I make previously login in that application. And they don't per ask me to make a login again. They use the same token that I am using in this other application. So basically, this is what we make in Identity Federation. So what happened in the past is that this approach uh, cannot be made, especially in the browser. Why? Because two related domains don't have access to the cookies. So in this case, we have domain one can, that can be Katana, and we have domain two that can be Orca. So one user uh, make login, for example, in Katana, and when they want to go and make login in Norca will be required to make login again because we don't have access to this token that we previously obtained in Katana. So was created the concept of the federated identity. So federated identity is uh, create a system that can permit two related domains to access the same information that we have hosted in the cookies. So in that moment, well, in nowadays, we also cannot obtain uh, access to the cookies to other domain instead when it's related. What they made was introduce this uh, concept of identity provider. So now, uh, one uh, domain or one service will be make the authentication with the identity provider, and it's the identity provider the one that will save these cookies, uh, uh, this, the, the, the token in the cookies. So also then we go with this second uh, domain that will be Orca will go directly to the identity provider. So we can see that in this more complex uh, diagram. So now we have domain one that will make the login with this out server. And it's the out server, the one that will save these special cookies with the token. And then the domain two will go also with the out server. And the out server will verify if it has some cookies saved in the browser. Say, OK, yes, I have a token with this user. So I will bring to you access to this token. So we will not require to the user make a second login. So 
And this is the systems that we use for permit users uh, handle, uh, make login with other things. So we have a lot of ones. It's not only Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, or LinkedIn. We have some social federated identities, and we also need to evaluate which things we will need to use in our system. This is other ones. This is our legal federated identities. So it's really interesting. Then we have the authentication section. So here we have the single signing on. We have multi-factor authentication, passwordless, and federated identities. In this case, uh, well, the federated identity, uh, <laughs> we'll start, we, we don't talk about single signing on because this is what all of us know. And then we have federated identity. In this case, is implement this federated identity for permit other users use my system as an authentication method. So we will continue. So what happened after create a role of rules that doesn't work for create good passwords? So they say we need to make other improvements in logging. So they say we need to make that users make login with something that they know, they have, and also they are. So this is when we are uh, request a single signing on, and we request the user introduce a token, make facial recognition, or a fingerprint. Uh, so this is what we call now uh, multi-factor authentication. So exist other ways, for example, receive an SMS code uh, and introduce this code in our application. Uh, this is other app that is called Guardian. Uh, so in this case, we are making login in a website that generate a QR code. And I have an application called Guardian. And with this application, I will scan this QR code. So I will register this website in uh, my application. And now I will have access to uh, allow or deny access to this website. So I am going here in the application, and I will allow the access to this website. So I always ask that. But when you were a student in the university, did you forgot close your Facebook session in the lab of the university? No. Do you, do you use Facebook? No? This is why, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in other places, people laugh a lot because always that you see that someone forgot close his session is someone going there to be annoying with you, to post things that are not correct. It's like... Damn it. So imagine that you are walking and you remember that you forgot close this session. You can go to Guardian and deny the access to this website. So anyone will can continue doing things in your uh, application. So then we have the biometric sessions that is not only about touch ID and facial recognition. Also exist system when we can use uh, iris or retina recognition, voice recognition. Uh, also, this can be implemented with Twilio. We have typing recognition. This is interesting, but we have a uh, cell phone they you take a cell phone to someone else and say you are not the owner to this cell phone because you are not typing like the owner. Uh, we also have DNA usage, you know, like Etna Moda in Incredibles. The next thing that we have is passwordless. Passwordless really mean uh, try to provide the users options for make login without a password. So also, we can create system when we never say password of users or we have the password as a backup uh, method of logging. So I have here a diagram for a company. In this case, the company is using the approach to try to make their employees access faster to the system. So in this case, the first thing that they do is verify to this user is accessing the system from a registered IP address. So if not, they will require multi-factor authentication. The next verification that they do is verify that they are in a health offenses register. So I mean, I say this IP address is in my home, and this is the health fences around my home. If it's not, they will require, again, multi-factor authentication. If not, people is in. They don't need to put any credentials. Then we have the Touch ID. This is for fingerprints. So in this case, uh, fingerprint is a unique thing that we have. So we are reading our fingerprint. Uh, we are verifying this fingerprint exists previously in the system. If exists, I only will create a token. If not, I will create that as a new user, and the user is in, in my system. Then also we have the SMS codes. Uh, in this case, we put our username that is, we say to you, we will send to you an SMS code to the cell phone. Uh, good practice if we are implementing this is uh, required to the user that they uh, confirm the user, uh, the SMS code. Because uh, sometimes they never actualize information in our system and we can send an SMS code to a cell phone that they don't have. 
And finally, they will introduce the, co uh, the, uh, the code and they are in, in the system. Finally, we have the magic link. So how many of you use Slack? Yeah, many of you. So Slack is the master of magic links, at least for the mobile application. So what we do is put our email address. So they verify that we existed, and then send to us a link. Uh, this is the magic link. And when I click the magic link, I am in, in all the dashboard that I am logging in Slack. So then how we have to have a successfully identity management project. Uh, and I will say we have a lot of uh, well oversights in, in development. And the first one is don't understand that our users have an entire identity, uh, well, an entire life cycle in our system. The second one, that this is so common, I don't was in any country that say, no, here we don't do that. But it's like we have a new project and we always have a users module and say, you know, copy the implementation that we have in this other project. But it's not in that way. It's not just copy code that we have in other uh, implementations. So we need to ask to us what needs, uh, needs has this project. So the first thing is ask to us how we will create those users. So we will have in the console that someone else will create this, uh, these users. They will make a signing up, so they will register themselves, or we will send an invitation to join the systems. These are some things. But also, we can have users uh, that are created in other place. So that happened when we are migrating, for example, legacy applications. Those applications have users. So we don't need to create new users, or we will need to make a migration to those users. So we need to ask things like, I will can migrate the passwords. So I have access to the encryption algorithms that were used uh, for create those uh, users. Or I will need to send the users an email saying, you know, you need to restart your uh, password or something like that. Then will be uh, the user uniqueness. And uh, not always is the email address. Sometimes we need to require to the users that they create uh, a nickname or a username. But I will put an example. So I use a platform that permit make login with Gmail and GitHub. The fact is that I create GitHub with my Gmail account, right? So I have two accounts, one with uh, GitHub and one with Gmail. That basically is I am using the same email address, but they are not using uh, this uh, unique identifier. So I can have two accounts with the same email address just for that. The next thing is how users will make login. And in these cases, we need to ask things like, we will need multi-factor authentication. We will need always since the beginning multi-factor authentication, or I will require to the user a second step verification just in some cases inside my system. I will really need to use a single signing on, or I only can use or provide other kind of uh, a systems of make login. I will put an example. I have some clients that we uh, created the user with send an email address to welcome to the system. This is your username and this is your password. And I don't know how, but they never can copy and paste the password and make login. And I also, because usually they make copy also uh, empty spaces uh, before, after the password. So I remove the empty spaces and they also cannot make login. So we uh, stop to use single signing on and we are only using magic links because they never can do login. So sometimes maybe we will don't need a single signing on. The next thing is what devices will be used. So I will have only a web browser. I will have mobile applications. I will have other kind of options for use my system. So how many of you use WhatsApp? Yeah, many of you. How many of you use the web uh, browser for website or the desktop applications? Yeah, all of us, right. What happened in WhatsApp is like I can see a list of all devices when I register this uh, WhatsApp. And also, I can uh, in the application, I can restrict access. I say, you know, I want that you close the session that I have in this browser or in this computer. So we need to face those things too in our system. So I need to how I will handle these devices. Also have another thing, and is if I will permit to one user have more than one session open in those devices. So for example, bank applications are really restricted about that. You only can have one active session in only one device. The next thing is what happened when the users make logout. 
I saw some implementations when we make logout, but if also I am going to make a backward uh, inside the history of the browser, also in that when I make uh, logging out, I can access to the things because the only thing that they make in the logout button was redirect to the logging page, but they don't erase the history or they are not verifying if we have access or not to those uh, uh, other websites, right? Or they don't erase the token of the cookies. So the next thing is how uh, browser configurations uh, will influence in our sessions. Also, if we are using cookies in our mobile applications. So I will put an example. I use a system. If I I may log in, but I am forced to make logout for everything works okay. If I only close the tab um, and I try to access again, always bring me an easy. It's an authentication error, and I cannot make login. Instead, I, I uh, clean all my cookies. So this is a wrong configuration of the cookies in this system. The next thing is session timeouts. Is my system will need uh, timeouts or not? I will can permit have a uh, opening permanent uh, sessions, or how many time I will bring for have the session timeout. The next thing is what happened when it's over. Um, this not always is critical, but for example, what happens if people can make illegal things in my system? So I need to save a history of when the people erased an account. I need to wait some time and keep all this information. We will erase that information. We will bring the user uh, the option to day return after some month and recovery all that information. So these are things that we need to take in mind. This is really important. Password reset. But some systems don't implement a password reset. So if you forgot your password, it's nothing that you can do, except that you know the guys that are implemented this system. So it's really important. The next thing is blocked users. What will be my policies for blocked users? In which cases? The next thing is anomaly detec detections. And this is also a little bit related with the devices. So I am really detecting uh, when the people had many failed attempts to log in, what I do with those users when they happen this. Or for example, when I, now that we use the email and I change, for example, of cell phone, and they say, you know, you make a new login from a different cell phone that they usually use it. So it's you or it's not you, or a different device. Also, I IP addresses uh, with different locations. So, you know, yesterday you were in Ukraine and now you are in Belgium. So it's really you or it's not you, or sometimes with different of ours. So we need to detect those things too. And then we have the privacy compliance requirements. So maybe now here with the GDPRs don't have these problems, but in other parts of the world, uh, developers or the, the companies never create a privacy policy about all the information that they will handle of the users. This is other quite interesting is audit logs. What happened with the logs? It's like, okay, I am receiving all these JSONs in my REST API. And what I do with the logs is I print the logs, uh, those JSONs in the logs. Also, the login JSON with the username and the password. So that means that anyone with access to my logs will have access to the user credentials. Then uh, consider how identity information will change uh, over the time in, in my application. So in which moment I will require to the user that they make uh, an actualization of information. Also, if we have policies like you need to change your password every three months or every six months. So one problem here is how I will implement all those things in a system, right? This is why we make a copy and paste to other user module for one system to other when we are creating new implementation. So we can use an identity as a service. Basically, an identity as a service is uh, a service that we can use for you, everything of that. So the clouds have these implementations. We have a sure Active Directory, Oracle Identity Management, Firebase Authentication, Amazon Cognito. Google Cloud Platform didn't implement his own identity as a service. What they made was make a partnership with the people from out zero for handle identity as a service. So in the Oracle ecosystem, we have the famous that is Okta, and also we have WSO2. 
And then we have other identity as a service. Uh, we have this RSA security ID that also is so used in banks and in certified one login, and we have these other ones. So intermedia, mini orange. So now talk about the architecture level from this identity as a service. So we talk about the REST APIs, right? So what happened with microservices and serverless is that we are using them for develop REST APIs. And this are, is an architecture a little bit more complicated. So we have here new actors, like this API Gateway. So now the client also continue making uh, this uh, authentication process in the identity provider. But now we are delegating to the API Gateway at least that verification to the token. Also, it depends on which API Gateway we are using, we can make to the API Gateway verify with the identity provider if that user have access to the resource that he want to access in the microservices or in the serverless. So that means that my request never arrive to the microservices or also to the serverless if they don't pass the API gateway. So in the past, in a REST API, in every single service, we were uh, making this verification, verify that was a valid token, verify that have access to that. Now we are doing that in a previously way. For example, in a serverless approach, when we pay only when a function is being executed, remove this from the uh, function is really good because I am not expending time or money or resource for verify just if this token is valid and uh, the user have access to this uh, function. So the API gateway is uh, facing this. So we have time. So I will use here Express Gateway. In, in the case of Express Gateway, we only can verify to this is a properly signed token. And before we go to the demo, uh, and here is the Git repository when all these slices are. Uh, this is my fan page. You don't use Facebook, so don't care. And this is my Twitter handle if you want to follow me or want to post something interesting that you found uh, in this presentation. So now I will switch. Okay. So this is the configuration to express API Gateway. I also, uh, I am running this uh, API Gateway in my computer. So what I have here is first some configurations. Um, well, the first one is that I am saying that I will use just HTTP. If I use HTTPS, I need to put HTTPS, and I will receive my request in the port in 9000. The next things that we do is uh, define the API endpoints that we have my will handle my uh, API gateway. So I put the name to Mother IDM. I put here the host. I put that can be anyone, but I can put here, for example, the specific domain. Uh, this API gateway will receive this. Then the path will be Mother IDM, and I say that I only will permit. Uh, um, request uh, by post. The next thing is uh, the service endpoint. This service endpoint is to which uh, will point my API gateway after that. So in this case, I have defined it here, the URL for a function that is hosted in web task. So we will not open web task because web task is a platform, a serverless platform that is going to be removed as a service, but continue working. The next thing that we will do is uh, face our policies. So I put here the JWT policy for make the verification of the JWTs, and we always have the proxy policy. Now we have the pipelines. So here I will define again the mother IDM. So I said that this will be a pipeline for the API endpoint mother IDM. And now I have here how I will verify this token. So I download here, I have here the key that is being used for uh, sign all the tokens. So I am saying I will use this key for verify these tokens. And then we have the part of the proxy that is for the service endpoint mother IDM. So I'm going here now to the, I will put zoom here. This is insomnia, it's just for test uh, uh, services. So I have here the, the endpoint to my serverless function. So I will send here, and uh, this function only will return to us. Uh, okay, it's not working. This it's great. Yeah. Okay, I will cancel this. This is no good. Well, 
Here I have for validate my token. I have here a uh, old uh, token, so I will modify this one. This is a pointing to my local host in my API gateway, the mother IDM. So I send this, and they say, okay, this is an unauthorized token. And now I will obtain a new token. Uh, I, ha I am using a, an out zero platform. So I didn't make all this uh, from zero. So I have here all my credentials, and I will make a send here. And this uh, will return to me um, a token. And I will put here the validation in the header. I will send uh, change this. Um, uh, usually, uh, we send this in the authorization header as a beer token. So now I will send that, and it's possible that this doesn't work. Oh, yes, work. So here, answer. It's like token successfully was validated. So I will consume this again. This work. So this is. Simple like that. So this is a quite simple uh, example. So if someone have doubts or something, can write me in my Twitter. And I really appreciate all of you for it came to my talk. And I hope you continue enjoying the conference. <laughs>